Yeah. So uh, welcome. I was mentioning that the uh, the plan for today um, was to talk about uh, the remaining pre category three chapters. So so chapters six and seven, the preparatory sort of chapters. These are chapters on formalisms, right? Um, why we express things formally, et cetera. And then the chapter on equivalence relations. Mm -hmm. um, that's for today. Um, but then, uh, and, and those laid the groundwork for talking about categories. They sort of lay the the basis for analogies and 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 appreciation of of uh, the categorical perspective and cate category theory as as providing a sort of nice balance between flexibility and 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 uh, but having enough enough a sort of structure and constraints that you can you're guaranteed to have reasonable sort of uh, uh, reasonable types of, of of understanding with it. it it's not chaotic. Um, and so the next time will be chapter eight. Okay, that's the category, uh, the category chapter. Um, and I was saying that my hope is, my plan is to weave that together with some examples that would illustrate a little bit more, but particularly privileging examples related to our lines of work, health modeling, modeling and community safety well-being. Um, and increasingly, as we go chapter by chapter, we're going to be featuring more and more of that. Like the, chapter eight, it's going to be kind of some very basic stuff. And there'll be some elements of that we'll talk about, like categories that will serve as the schema category for stock and flow modeling or categories that serve as the schema category for Petri nets and that sort of modeling, dynamic modeling. Um, we will we will see some materials related to our group's work, but then as chapters, as, as we go on chapter by chapter and we get to things like functors and we get to, to uh, topics like adjunctions and so on, we'll see more and more stuff related directly to our work. And we'll start weaving in, we'll go slower through the chapters and start weaving in more and more stuff directly related to our lab's work, um, applying this to uh, the health and social issues. Okay, so that's, that's the plan. Chapter six and seven this time and eight, um, um, in our next time. And we'll come back to the scheduling of this in just a minute or, or, or later before we break. Okay, so chapters six and seven. Um, we had, again, formalisms and equivalence relations. And um, the purpose of this class is to be able to go through and discuss these topics and uh, interested in your reactions to these chapters uh six uh six and seven uh for today so uh people's thoughts uh, here about these chapters uh anything that stood out to you that you want to explain with you or strike you as interesting or strike you as confusing or puzzling what are what are people's thoughts on this Chapter seven, I kind of flew through a little bit just because it also kind of like review on computer science, which is like the paid logic stuff. Yep. So, do you cover equivalence relations, sir? Um, I don't know about in uh, in two sixty, but uh, but I, I did go a bit slower through the part on equivalence relations. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, that is found it to be relatively straightforward. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um. So you know, one of the I think. For me, one of the things that struck me as likely tied up with the motivation for that material is this having a a notion of sameness that is not beholden to or, or strictly limited to or you know just wedded intractably to the notion of equality that you know the only way we consider things the same is they're actually equal. Clearly. There's a big motivation in that chapter to introduce 
equivalence relations as a way of understanding sameness that's more general, still useful, um, but not as, as restrictive. Uh, and it turns out categories will have a, um, a, a further uh, sort of loosening of some of those uh, those constraints while still you know being uh, having enough uh, uh, well-behaved properties that you can get tremendous insights. Uh, so equivalence relations also are related to a, a lot of topics that are going to come up in category theory with things like pushouts, um, co-limits, where you're 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 taking things that are otherwise independent and then some of the things are identified together, like some go in the same equivalence class. And you'll see, like when we join together stock and flow diagrams, um, this is how this works. When you compose stock and flow diagrams, it turns out that we we sort of sort of say these two things are are basically the same. Um, you know, the stock S in the FV model is the same as the stock in the SIR model. And, and by identifying that, we compose them and we get an SIRV model. It's, it's really this ability to sort of say, these things are the same. And that's, that's a prominent thing in category theory. And it's a prominent thing in, that comes up in, in kind of math courses with like congruence relations and modular arithmetic, et cetera. But it's a really big thing in category theory. Okay. And it's really big for how we use this with our stock, with our modeling. Um, so equivalence relations were, you know, a big factor there uh, in, in that chapter, certainly. That was the, the defining feature. But there are these other subtexts here um, within it uh, of kind of other other things that we were were learning about and in the process, right? Um, so does anyone remember with equivalence relations, what are these properties that, you know, we have uh, with equivalence relations that, um, that make them uh, an equivalence relation that definitely are a property? Yes. Good. Um, yeah. Symmetry good. Good. And and what is what is reflexivity? Is it remember, remember? Things have to be in the same equivalence class of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So in some sense, things have to be the same as themselves, right? And in in the category chapter, chapter eight, there's a notion. You know, everything needs a relation to itself. It is some notion of relation of identity to itself. Um, this is going to be a really big thing in category theory. In fact, everything is going to have. It's we're not it's so it's so ubiquitous. We don't even draw it. This little identity arrow to itself. Everything is related to itself. Um, so that's reflexivity. Everything is in the same equivalence class as itself. It's kind of almost, almost you know something you don't even think you have to emphasize, right? Symmetry. Um, we have thing board here. Um, and am I am I recording this properly right now? Can anyone tell me? Yeah, I am. Okay, awesome. So we have reflexivity. Good. Things are in the same. Yeah, th th this things are related to themselves. We have this relation, right? This relation has these properties, right? A rela not all relations have these properties, but for it to be an equivalence class that has to have these properties, reflexivity, things have to be related to themselves, right? So, so we might write that R. You know, R A R A, right? Um, but he likes uh, Eugenia Chang likes to write it like like this, right? With this kind of nice little asymmetric uh, thingy. I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't know 
I tried, yeah, I, I tried to search for it in Google Docs so I could put it in my document and I didn't know what to call it, you know, like rounded box or, or something. Is that like uh, yeah, it's kind of rect a, round, a rectangle with a rounded end that's nice asymmetric, right? I think calling it a wide D. Oh, why? yeah, I kind of like that. I kind of like that. Um, okay, so reflexivity. What's what's another one? Uh, symmetry. Symmetry. Yeah. Um, and what is the symmetry here uh, involved? Like, uh, what are we what are we fundamentally saying? Um, if A is equivalent to B, then B is also put on the page. Okay. Uh, uh, that's right. Um, if if uh, so, B that's right. In 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 that case, we we will have that uh, B R A, right? Is that right? Um, like, I was going to ask. Yeah. If my brain is uh, on all these different levels of yeah. logic and concepts. Yeah. So like my brain for this is thinking about like trickiness. So like would it be reasonable yeah. to say that if you have this relation going one way, it implies that this is still true in the other way? Yes. Um I think that's fair to say that you know if, if we have this in the event we have this, if symmetry holds, we have to have this. Yeah. Um and vice versa, right? Um and uh, so if we have this, and we have to have, have that. And so this, in some sense, is the same as this, right? Like the, the information content, given the symmetry. Um, we know this is true. And, and so we, we, we require this, this symmetry. Um, and what's the final one? Uh, transitivity. Yeah, transitivity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so if AR if ARB and um, and BRC, right? Uh then what? On ARC. Uh so then A A R C exactly. So it, it follows through if you and she puts it more beautifully, right? I mean it's beautiful. Um she is obviously enormous appreciation for for the aesthetics here. Well, she is a concert pianist after all. Um you have this, then so if you if you have this right, then then you have as well a you know it follows that that a um, is in this relation to c right. So so these are so we have relations in general. Not all relations observe these, but if they do, then they qualify to be a what equivalent. And give, give me an equivalence relation. Give me an example of an equivalence relation. Equality doesn't mean equality, equality. and that, that's a kind of that's kind of the most yeah sort of uh, emblematic, the most familiar, the most um, you know what uh, the one that we reflectively turn to. Give me others that are equivalence relations. Being a sibling. Uh, well, okay, so. If yeah, so let's go through these, right? Um, so is someone a sibling of themselves? So? No, no, yeah. So, so sibling, I, you're thinking the right. You're you're thinking in the right direction. I love how you're thinking about um, about some family relationships there. Um, but I I don't think sibling because of it violates reflexivity. Right. Um actually I, I talked about that here. Yeah. Transitivity, yeah, yeah. Six okay, so um so okay, so you're saying the question is 
does one number divide? Uh, so we're looking for a relation, though. So you're saying the A is related to B if A divides B, but but A could divide B and not be A, right? So so addition and then I was thinking of colors and addition. Like if you add two colors of being together, uh -huh. you would have that reflexivity. You would have the symmetry of these colors becoming the new color and whatnot. Okay, we're but we're looking for a, a relation that would be true or false, whether one thing is like related to another for this chapter, right? Like it has to be a relation, like um that you know they they have this relation or not, right? And so I, I like your idea with the color, but what would the relation be? Would there? it not be combining the two colors? Sorry. Would it not be combining the two colors as a relation? Well, but that doesn't have like a remember that the definition of of of, of relation here earlier, right? If, if we if we look in the the notion where she introduces relation, um, and I'm just finding the the page here for it. Um, so uh, the idea of abstract relations, right? Um, so. Yeah, so um so she said, yeah, well, how we express skin term without knowing what it is, lad. Yeah, that's right. Um and and you know, these are constructs, uh these relations, right? Um are things that evaluate to true or false, like is one less than five, right? Um is 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 one thing equal to another, right? So so I love where you're going with the paint, but we'd need to we'd need to um, formulate it as something that's true or false, and we'd have to come up with something. But I think you've got folks who are getting into some interesting areas, and come up with one that's not not just uh, equal equality, but give me give me another one. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Please. This is great. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, so how many? Uh, uh -huh. Okay, so and not no I so how divisive. Divide. So it's asking does one thing divide another? Like so you're asking, does A like the relation is here? This would mean um if and only if uh a divides b something like that evenly goes to b so so that's a, a relation that's certainly a relation absolutely that's a great one i love it and it's one that plays or it's going to play an important role in some of our examples including the categories so so i agree completely that's a relation is it reflexive yeah. it is it is reflexive right it's it's not symmetric, right? Is it transitive? Well, we'll come back to symmetry in just a second. Is it transitive? If A divides B and B divides C, does A divide C? Yes. It does. It does. But is it symmetric? Is the question. So, like two divides A, right? You know, like, mm -hmm. But does that imply A divides two? Evenly? No. No. So 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 that's one I love it. Uh, it you have a condition it, for example, uh, e, um, ah, that is that is this so, well, okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is uh, so I love where you're going. This is awesome. Is this is this a uh is, so this is a relation, it's an awesome relation, it's a great relation. Is it a re relation that's transitive? 
If A is less than B and B is less than C, is A less than C? It is. It's transitive. <laughs> okay. Is it is it symmetric? No. no. And it's not why isn't it reflexive? Because what? Uh, because A is not less than itself. Yeah. Now if it were yeah. this, yeah. would it be reflexive? It would be. And would it be transitive? Would be would it be symmetric? Um, no, no. If you could have there, yeah, you could have a less than or equal to b by being less than it, and then b is not going to be less than or equal to a, right? But yeah, so I'm, I'm loving these the dialogue. So yeah, you will be set. Okay, come come up with the, the, the we're getting into good areas. Um, how do a and b are people? What can we ask about them being in a relation? I, I I really like what Nostaran was saying. And what what things could we ask them would be um uh, would be a different answer. If they we could say that people are in the same room as each other. Good. Or I guess you okay. can extend that more broadly and just say that membership in that. I, I love it. Okay, so let's say suppose AR you know, ARB or to use the Changian notation. A long D and Y D, yeah. Y T um A A um sort of rounded rectangle B um uh that this means A, so it means A is in the same room, right? Same room as B, um as B, and we could of course. Be more particular, like on September 27th, uh, you know, a certain time and so on, right? If we want to, to sharpen it. Um, so so let's ask, is it first of all, is it relation? Could we it'll be true or false for any two people? Okay. Um, is it reflexive? Is A in the same room as A? Oh, that's, that's right. Get, you know, it depends how you, you know, kind of like stand in the door or something, right? Half my head is outside, but my body's inside. But yeah, you could define it a certain way. Yeah, you know, at least a piece of me is in there, right? Um, is it symmetric? If what what would it mean for it to be symmetric here? If A is in the room, same room as B, and that means that B is in the same room as A. Okay. Do you, do we think that's true? Yeah. Yeah. And if A and, and what would it mean for it to be transitive? That's right. And and is that true? It's awesome. So the red of coffee and <laughs> fine. That's great. Who could come up with another one? Building off uh, yours, I was thinking rather than like sister or brother, like being like, oh, I'm part of the same family. Same family. Okay, good. So is it reflexive? Is A in the same family as A? Is A, is A, um, if A is in the same family as B and B, is B in the same family as A? Yeah. And what does transitivity mean? That if A is in the same family as B and B is in the same family as C, then it's not to be in the same family. And is that true? Yeah, great, great. Okay, how about more? Give, give me, give me, give me some more examples. This is great. The last few examples are both just saying that set membership is an equivalent relation. Um, I'm trying to think of something more interesting than that. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. Mm. So she has some examples where, you know, asking, like, are these the equivalence relations? And she discusses them. Let me ask, how do, what if someone were to say to you, I think... A and B being 
set up in the same room that they're nearby. A is nearby B and B is nearby C. Um, sorry, if, if that A, if the relation is A is nearby B, true or false? You know, where we define nearby to be within 10 meters. Is that an equivalence relation? And what goes wrong? Transitivity, right? They are within 10 meters themselves. Reflexivity is true. Is symmetry true? Yeah. Is transitivity true? Not necessarily, right? A can be within 10 meters of B, and B can be within 10 meters of C, but A is not within 10 meters of C, right? And remember, transitivity, this may seem kind of limited because because you're limited to three things. This could be an important point for a category theory discussion. It makes it seem like you're limited to three things, A, B, and C, right? But is is it really, is the implication of it limited to, to three things? Why not? What can we do? Because it's more related to everything and it's more consistent. Yeah, we can chain it together, right? Like with the with the relationship. Because we didn't have to show all the errors because we exactly, exactly. And this is going to be a really important thing. So this is a lot more powerful. I I think of transitivity is a really neat thing because it's almost like this is where discoveries take place in the sense that things that maybe weren't stated to you up front, like that A is related to C, you can deduce from A is related to B and B is related to C. You know, in a in a um, equivalence relation, you can deduce A is related to C, right? You can have discoveries about it, right? Um, even though they weren't told to you, it's kind of an emergent property of those facts. We deal with, you know, in, in our modeling, we deal all the time with emergence. Emergent, the phenomenon of emergence, capturing phenomena of emergence is one of our big goals with dynamic modeling. And it comes out of equivalence relations too. You get these ahas, right? Of things that weren't given to you directly, but are applied. And it turns out those will pop up in a categorical concept in a context as well. It's kind of cool, but they they pop out in sort of things analogous in a way to that you can see as kind of distant cousins of, of these sort of equivalence relations. Um, so this is is kind of, um, uh, you know, this has a lot of structure to it. Um, can we come up with any other any other examples? Yeah, the reason. Uh, the date is within October or something. Um, yes, okay. So, okay, okay, so like a what date within October? I like how you're thinking. So we could do it, if any of people, we could ask if they are both, Born within October, right? And a a rounded rectangle B if A and B are born in October, are both born well, are both born in the same month, right? Is it reflexive? Yes. Is it symmetric? Yes. Is it transitive? Yes. Right. If A is born the same month as B. And B is born the same month as C, then A, uh, A is born the same month as C. Mm -hmm. it, would it be still a equivalence relation if you said A is born within a 30 day period of B? No, where does it fail? Transitivity. It's one of the A Yeah, yeah, their age is equal, right? Integer age, say, right? And it could be. Non integer, but it could be like born instantly at the same time. But yeah, integer age is in years is, is the same, would be another one. And as as Eugenia Chen says, as the author says, you know, like those are kind of riding the top notions on numbers too, right? That that the numbers are the same. And I think this is what Eric was getting at, that a lot of these are are kind of they boil down to more familiar ones with like sets or equality of numbers or something like that. Like the two, the integer for my age and for your age is equal or equal or something like that. But Eric, you were going to say something. Um, yeah, uh, one of the other examples that 
I guess it is a set membership question you could boil it down to that as well. But anyway, yeah, this like it's the modular arithmetic. So A is related to B if A mod C is the same thing as B mod C. Exactly. Um and th that's right. Um uh so so sorry, A. Um so so yeah, why don't we say it mod N to sure. avoid yeah, okay, A B C yeah. when we get to transitivity, right? Um so, so we'll consider A and B to be the same, that is in the same equivalence class, if what? Uh, if A mod N equals B mod N. That's correct. That's right. So, or, so if, um, uh, if it's an omnia, uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, where is, where is it? If and only if uh, A, um, A equals uh, D, uh, mod n, right? Is I think how she writes it. Some, which is which is interesting because for me, like I look at this and actually I'm not immediately used to the precedence being assumed. So like like glancing at I would think this binds more closely to that than than um than these two. But the way she writes it, it's kind of this equals to this mod mod n, right? I guess we don't have that way. A equals B, you know, when interpreted mod n. In other words, A mod n equals B mod n. I'll, and I'll write that out, right? A mod n um, equals B mod n. I feel more somewhat more comfortable writing like that. Um, okay, so so that is that. Is that a relation that that um, that A and B are related if and only if A um, mod N equals B mod N? Is that a relation? Is it an equivalence relation? Does it is it a reflexive? A A mod N equals A mod N. Yeah. <laughs> nope. Sorry. Uh, otherwise, my computer is going to crash real soon. Uh, is it symmetric? So if so, so tell me what symmetry means here. You mean between the A and the B, right? Yeah. 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 Between A and B, not not N. Yeah. Good, 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 good call. And that's why I wanted it to be N, not B or C. So so yeah, is it symmetric? So so tell me what symmetry means here. In in this case, would it mean if A mod N equals B mod N and B mod N equals A mod N. Um yeah right. so uh, so it would it would be, you know uh, it would mean if A mod N equals B mod N then B mod N equals A mod N which kind of follows out of the symmetry of equals right um uh okay and or commutivity of equals and how about transitivity yeah so so do we think that's true yeah that's true so it's a beautiful equivalent it's a wonderful equivalence relation. um and it's an important equivalence relation in here in computer science right um and it's one that will take us through a lot of um uh you know a, a lot of uh examples um yes ah being being what uh, co-workers or colleagues yeah so i like this so if a is uh i love it that you're thinking about this if a is a co-worker of b so so let's walk it through is that a relation a is a you know a a rounded rectangle B means A is a coworker of B. So uh, is that a relation? Yes, uh, Larissa? I was just thinking about this, but then it ended up becoming that reflexivity, you know, uh -huh. and then it ended up becoming the greater than or less than symbol because mm -hmm. you end up with the reflexivity and the symmetry not actually running up the way you want it to. Because I was thinking of it like it's like the mm -hmm. the bureaucratic hierarchy where you have that boss and all that stuff, and then. Oh. But, but oh, you, I see. Have a, you still have a reflectivity issue. 
Okay, so it's A if coworker is A. Yeah. Yeah. That's so that's a really good point. Yeah, it depends. You could say, are they, and I think this is what you were getting at, are they in the same institution? A mod, you know, uh uh a, a run rectangle B, if and only if A is in the same institution, works in the or yeah, is employed by is employed by the same is A is employed by the same institution as B. Yeah. Yeah. In the same institution. Uh oh, B you just a second. So is that symmetric? I'm sorry, is it reflexive? Yes. They're in the same institution as themselves. Yeah. Is it symmetric? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what was your for that? Well, so would it still be like A and B within the same institution. Right. So if so if A is in the same institution as B, does that mean that B is in the same institution as A? Yeah. Yeah. Can it, and is it sorry? Can it be yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have an example in the um, in the, the university uh -huh. for mathematical. Mm -hmm. uh, that um, this example was, for example, I live at the uh, Saskia. Yeah. Uh, so I uh, or I uh, work at the this company. Yeah. I I related with myself because I work with my, with myself at this company. Yeah. And I I uh, I um. Uh, I am uh, uh Larissa and I live at the substitute so related to mm -hmm. even because we live at the same place. Right. And uh, Larissa and uh, uh Eric. Eric, mm -hmm. live at the substitute so right. related to each other because uh, they live at the same uh, right. same place. Right. And uh, it will, uh, we we are related yes. because we uh, we live at the same Right, so living in the same place or being at the same yeah. institution, all those work, you know, quite nicely as examples, and they're awesome examples. They're they're they're, they're great. Um, so you know, I love that. Um, uh, in the same family, um, you know, she does talk about is A being a friend of B. <laughs> you know, is that? <laughs> You know, uh, is it a um, you know is it an equivalence relation and and um, you know it's not uh, not necessarily true they're friends themselves. Um, I love I love her example. It's just like the most awesome thing. That's a really wide rectangle on the top of wide D on the top of page ninety. Did you see that? Show it to Tony too. Um, <laughs> wow. So here is A is a sister of B, right? Um, um, I'm definitely, I'm not my own, <laughs> as I am not my own sister. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's it's pretty cool that this this notion of of equivalence uh, relations that she introduces, right? Um, now she says on. And section seven point eight, um, she she has some really interesting, thoughtful words here, right? Um, uh, so a couple of things. She says, "Look, um, uh, that equivalence relations are particularly well behaved relations." She says, "But they are so well behaved that they are, in a way, not that interesting." And up to the top of that paragraph, she says. I want to draw attention to the fact how few things turn out to be equivalence uh, relations. And she says, and this is absolutely key for the motivation for category theory. Um, it's this next sentence. Moreover, many of the things that fail to be equivalent relations are mathematically interesting concepts we may still want to study, right? Um, in math as in life, something that doesn't, um, if something doesn't fit original constraints, we can either continue to exclude them or lack, relax our constraints to let them in. And she says in both math and life, I believe in recognizing when our constraints have been unreasonably rigid, excluding things to people just because of preconceptions, outdated practices, and fears. And really, category theory um, will allow us to sort of generalize and relax the, the constraints here. A lot of category theory um, in ways I'm just still learning to grok, you know, it's about this notion of relaxed sameness. We deal a lot with things like 
um, dealing with equivalence of categories or isomorphisms, et cetera. And, and it turns out like that's really useful. And even, even we'll say two things are the same as long as there's a natural transformation between them. We won't even require them um, to you know, be uh, directly isomorphic or, or what have you. And, and it turns out it's really useful to do that. So her point here is, look, this is great, but ultimately, and I think Eric, you were getting at this, a lot of this stuff with equivalence class, a lot of those we came up with, wonderful, same, being in the same place, being in the same company or institution, having the same age, right? Um, uh, being in the same room as. They were awesome examples, but ultimately they tended to boil down to kind of equivalent, like equality of numbers and that sort of stuff. And, and that's okay, but her point is, I think there's, it reflects the fact there's few basic things that are equivalence relations where there's, if you're willing to be a bit looser in your rules, um, you you can actually do a lot more interesting things yet and still get things that are well behaved. And category theory, um, you know, is one of these things which has this amazing balance between having enough flexibility to express this massive, just unbelievably massive set of things, but enough enough sort of regularities and, and structure that you that it's really well behaved, et cetera. Um, and she she comments like equivalence relations turn out to be logically the same as partitions. So we we partition off the world into these, do you remember what they're called? They're called what? Equivalence classes. We partition out the wall and equivalent classes, right? So we 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 draw people out here. Here's all the people in the world, right? Um, and I won't try to draw all of them because I'll be here for a while and talk a lot about. But but you know we kind of partition them into people in the same room, right? Um, these are our people in the same room um, here, and and there's a different partitioning. Are are they in the same institution? Or is it a different partitioning? Do they have the same age? But the point is, they're different partitions. Partitions, well, some really interesting math associated with them when it comes into category theory. But, but you know, these are these are um, they're basically close cousins. There's they're great. I love them. They're beautiful, but they are quite rigid, um, just like equality and. And her point is, and we'll see at this very next chapter, our very next session when we get to categories, will will work to sort of um, help help um, loosen these constraints. And among, and among other things, um, we're going to be relaxing the, the symmetry um, side. We'll allow things A to be related to B without being B, B being related to A in the same way through arrows, right? Uh, arrows. Um, and you notice that her square bump, it almost looks like if you squint at it from far enough away, it's like a fat arrow or something like that. It's very pointy. It's pointing in a certain direction as it's kind of blunt nose in one direction. Um, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll have that, but we'll retain something that's, that reminds us a lot of symmetry. Everything's can be related to itself and something that reminds us a lot of trans transitivity. We'll have the ability to pose two arrows and get a third arrow, always, always. We have that structure, but symmetry will, will come up in the context of like isomorphisms in the context of inverses of each other. It'll be awesome, but it won't be force-fitting it into this structure so that we, we get these, uh, uh, we get these partitions in that way. So I thought that was that was kind of a, a cool um, chapter and one we can relate to. Um, I also thought there were some interesting things early um, in, in the very opening paragraphs here. She says, um, category theory is based on the idea of relationships, right? Um, we, uh, we build contexts in which to study things. Those are the categories. And we're going to have relationships within those categories as arrows between things. So state 
relations. A, a is related to B, A will have an arrow to B. Um, and, and everything's going to be related to itself. A is, there's some guaranteed relation to itself. That's sort of an identity relation. Um, uh, so we built these contexts, which are categories in which to study these relationships. These are kind of our micro worlds. Um, uh, but she says, and, and again, this is just beautifully, you know, articulate. Um, uh, although, although this is quite general, we still have to be a bit specific about the relationships because if we allow any old type of relationship, we get complete chaos. So we, so we need to put a few mild conditions on the types of relationships we study. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, in this chapter, we're going to explore the idea of putting relationships or uh, putting conditions on relationships. Where are the conditions we put on relationships for for them to be equivalent relations? Where are they sitting right now? Just behind them. Yeah, those conditions, right? Those are the conditions we put on them. In the next chapter, that's chapter eight. That's the category theory chapter. We'll look at what conditions we actually use in category theory, which would be a, a, a relaxation. Um, and uh, and then she says, you know, um, in this chapter, we're in the equivalence chapter, uh, equivalence class chapter, we're going to explore a type of relationship that has rather stringent conditions on it before seeing, next chapter, how we can relax the conditions but still retain organized structure when we just define categories. And, and the idea is, is to do with generalizing the notion of equality. So again, this notion of sameness, having a broader notion of sameness will run through category theory. And it will lead to awesome sort of flexibility and, and, and insights uh, that we can have there that we're not gonna get when we just force everything into to equality. Any other comments people wanna make on chapter seven before we go back now to, to talk a little bit about chapter six? We did it a little bit differently, but they, I don't think they have to be in one order or another. Yeah, Louisa. I, I don't know if this is uh, on topic or not, but I really appreciate the sort of style of look at how pretty this thing is and how easy it is to like use and recognize. Now let's let's like shift it into a more ugly version of <laughs> itself. Because like with other courses, you mm. you get taught uh, like the prettiest version, mm. and then you're like, okay, reality is not like this. Here, here is this mutated version. Right. But these properties are beautiful, and I really appreciate that sort of like laying the groundwork for the eye squinting and whatnot, mm -hmm. and looking at future things. Yeah, I I thought it was also very thoughtful, and I thought that it was kind of interesting insights into how mathematicians think about structure and about kind of um, the, the properties that having a smaller set of structure or larger or more rigid set of structure or a looser set, how that gives rise to properties. And this kind of, particularly this balance between Needing enough structure so you're not so it's well behaved so it's, it behaves reasonably you don't get chaos but having little enough structure that you have great flexibility I thought that was just you know really really an interesting balance and um, you know with with modeling it reminds me a little bit of you know in dynamic models I suppose of, of having too much in the model that's distracting and, and makes it rigid and hard to evolve and too little in the model to get insights, et cetera. It's the kind of Goldilocks, same same Goldilocks uh, idea. Um, but this is, um, you know, providing this framework, this foundation for a category theory, which we're coming to. like. The ideas in these chapters are laying that conceptual foundation for these basic rules of category theory that we're going to see next time, which you'll immediately see is like, oh, 
yeah, this is like my old friend now, right? Okay, let's go to chapter six. So what was six about? What's six about? Started with types of tourism, right? Um, but what was this? What was this about? Sort of like giving formal mm -hmm. definitions mm -hmm. to things that again, like I really like how she lays the groundwork for things because I can see it coming because I've experienced this before. Yeah. If I was not experienced with mathematics, then mm -hmm. it was like a really clever way of laying these things that I'm just like, yeah, sort of. Providing motivation that I know that a lot of people in mathematics don't understand motivation behind why they're learning something. So I like the the style mm. providing the motivation before giving all these like structured right. pieces to it. Right. And if you want to like if you want to find a real instructive um insight into just you know the the arc of of her um, depth of of range, dynamic range in terms of explaining things. You should check out her catsters videos sometime, which are just like as intense as they get. Like, okay, you want just like the bare essence? I'll give it to you. They, they are hilarious sometimes because she like she has three minutes and she's got to write all the, the, the triangle equalities associated with monads or something and she like does it. And, and, but this is like laying the groundwork for like why we care about those things and where the thinking comes from and why we ended up with those rules, which she then prepares. Now we'll find those casters videos by the end of this class, we'll find those videos actually quite helpful and fun, but but it's it's just fascinating for me to see the thinking that ultimately underlies them and 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 how those those elements can be useful and so on. And you know, this chapter is about expressing things formally, right? And there's a lot of things like in all of this that should resonate to us as computer scientists. Like um, right? Um, she this one there are a few things that really struck me here about this. Um, one is the centrality of the notion of abstraction. Um, you know, even on page, um, you know, page 68 um, or page 69, um, uh, she's talking about uh, choice of language. Computer science, we have this notion of metalinguistic abstraction. You you pick a language that that has the right the right abstractions for the problems you're studying. We do this with modeling all the time, right? Tony, you're the model you were working with um, with Wanda and for the food banks, right? Um, uh, for the Saskatoon Food Bank and the ecosystem providing food to the food bank. That was articulated in discrete event modeling because it had the right kind of fit formalisms wise, kind of the right building blocks uh, that you know the language of discrete event modeling, whereas um, the intimate partner violence model you wouldn't use that 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 those formalisms for discrete event modeling essentially right you would use you would use uh, perhaps even based modeling because it's more relational and and you have aspects of of uh, you know interpersonal interactions and interactions with the environment. That are more flexible than the workflows you have with the food bank, right? Um, and in other contexts, maybe it's dynamics of cholera or associated with cholera and reservoirs, or or you know components associated with uh, uh, with pollution and and um, uh, you know lacustrine environments. You might use uh, system dynamics model capturing stocks and flows, etc. Um, but the point is, we pick our language carefully, and you notice. Um, she she talks about page sixty eight. The formalism of mathematics is like a language specifically designed for what we're trying to do. Normal language is geared towards expressing things about our daily human experience, less to making rigorous arguments about abstract concepts. Um, so normal language falls short when we're trying to do math, right? Um, and she says uh, formal mathematical language and notation are partly to do with 
uh, efficiency and partly to do with abstraction. And that's, that's very much how I see it in computer science. Picking the right building blocks, picking the right language, picking the right sort of components in the language. Um, it allows us to have efficiency, like expressiveness. We can express what we're trying to, to do very succinctly and, and not have to write out A plus A plus A plus A plus A, you know, said we could write, you know, A times whatever it was, five. Um, instead of having to write A times A times A times A, um, you know, we can write A to the fourth, right? We, can, we have this efficiency and abstraction. Um, and she says these two concepts are, are related. And here she introduces abstraction, right? She, for example, on page um, page 71, she, she has this function, right? D of A comma B, do you see that? Um, that's a distance metric. It's a metric, a formally in mathematical terms, a metric. Come back to that in a second. Um, but she says, um, you know, the efficiency is to do when we keep talking about the same thing over and over again. Think, think software engineering, right? We see the same implicit concept over and over again, the same conditions in our code. Then it's more efficient, efficient to have a quick way to refer to it. That's why we build functions or methods in our code bases, because there's this natural sort of abstraction that is being referred to again and again and again. We need a way to name it and to use it and reuse it at one place to modify it, one place to go, you know, to fix errors with it, um, places to, you know, um, when it's being used to, to capture it in our debugger and, and, and place to update it for a more efficient algorithm or whatever. Um, uh, if, it, if you're only gonna mention it once, it doesn't matter too much, right? Um, mathematical language notation happens similarly. Um, uh, and she has this cookie example, which I love, right? Um, uh, but if you ever plan to uh, develop thoughts about that sort of thing, it helps to, um, to have these, these names for things, right? Um, and she also says, it's, it's interesting, um, we can also make analogies. She says, look, by writing with this notation, you can start to see similarities, right? You can, you write two plus three, and two times three, you start to say, well, wait a minute, there's there's something similar here. Like there's something about them that that is makes them close cousins. And as we'll see, we'll soon have, we'll still be you know, examining monoids. And it turns out that we can express plus on integers and times on integers as monoids. Um, they have different units. Um, the unit is the thing when you combine it with, with anything, with X, you just get X back. So for plus, what would be the unit of X? Or the unit for that, for plus. So what's the value that when you combine it with it, anything with plus, you get that thing back? Zero. Zero. How about for times? What's the unit? One. One, right? They're different units, but, but they both have this unit that when you apply it, it gives the same thing back, regardless of what side it's on, right? Zero plus X equals X, which equals X plus zero. Same thing with one times X equals X equals X times one, you know, either side, right? Mm. Um, so they're both monoids. And, and her point is like the notation helps you pick that up sometimes. And I think it's like that in computer science. It's like that with our models sometimes, right? We we build it and we, we capture some abstraction in our model that was hidden before. It was just implicit in the code and, and we capture, maybe we capture it in a state chart. And then we have that state chart and then we have another state chart capturing something else. And we say, well, wait a minute. We have this diabetes state chart and it has, you know, um, Undiagnosed, it is no doubt, it was no condition, you know, no diabetes, and then it has diabetes undiagnosed and diabetes diagnosed but not treated as a super state diagnosed diabetes has not treated and treated. And then maybe you have a, a, a heart, heart disease state chart, and you, you capture that with an abstraction, and then you, you realize, well, wait a minute, these are 
because we captured that abstraction, we see the similarity of the Sarah. There's a hidden higher level of abstraction here. It's like a health condition, right? Like Nostra and our are long in our long COVID model, right? There's this health condition, this this you know sort of underlying notion that applies for diabetes, it applies for heart disease, it applies for COPD, it, it applies for asthma. It, it applies for you know types of cancers. I mean, all sorts of um, different concepts, right? Um, communicable diseases, uh, influenza, COVID, you know, uh, RSV, etc. Um, uh, so, so you know, she's talking about about this, and and the point is by by giving it a name, we can also capture this higher level of thinking, these abstractions. We could see a higher level of abstraction. Um, and um, yeah, and, and she she no, talks about, what's that? No, she said about logic. Yeah, so she talked about logic and we'll be getting to that in just a, a little bit. Um, yeah, she, she, she talks about, I love it. You know, she's writing this in COVID lockdown, right? <laughs> She said at some point, did you see that in the book? She says, like, at this point in the draft, I I went into, you know, I I um, started, I came home and we went, went into lockdown. And then she said, I finished the draft of the book, uh -huh. but, you know, before I next emerged from my home, right? Um, it's pretty telling. But she has this um, exponentiation example, uh, right? Um, you saw that, right? Um, Exponentiation and exponentiation and system science, dynamic modeling. This is one of our favorite things. Where do we see this with exponentials uh, in in uh, system science and in in our dynamic modeling and including health? Where do we see this? For what sort of feedbacks? What's that? Non it's not linear. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, oh, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that. It can be linear and can be stayed and still give rise to this. Um, but um, positive feedback, right? Um, yeah, yeah, the snowball, right? Um, you get it with with positive feedbacks, right? Um, and you know, one infected infects two people, and, and each of them infects two goes to four people infected, and then to eight, and then sixteen, right? And it builds on itself, right? Um, and sometimes it's bad, and sometimes it's something people see, right? With spreading of a uh, word of mouth about a new product or about a TikTok video, whatever, right? Uh, tell me to people about it. Um, what is what is that? Um, anyway, so so you, you get this, and one one feature is uh, you know when you have these curves, the change in the next little bit. Is proportional to all the change that came before that, right? Um, when you when you have this, you know, e to the alpha t, right? Um, uh, the derivative, the derivative at a certain point of e to the alpha t, right? Um, is alpha e to the alpha t, right? So it's proportional to the value at that point, right? Um, so the rate of change is like proportional to this, right? It's like everything that came before, you're going to change in the next little bit by a month proportional to that. It's, it's kind of amazing, right? That makes sense if you have, you know, five times five times five times five. Um, five you know, five and, and what's that? Five. Yeah, yeah. And each time you're adding an extra five on by multiplying it, you're, you're adding on, you know, everything that came before, you're you're adding some factor on it, right? So maybe this is 1.1 times 1.1. And each, each time, if you add another 1.1, oh well, yeah, if everything that came before, you're boosting by 10%. Mm -hmm. um, okay, anyway, this, uh, so she talks about the, you know, the characteristics of exponentiation as different from the characteristics of repeated addition. And the point is that, Naming these things, having a notation of exponentiation, right? Having this ability to write this, to articulate this, lets us reason about it, recognize it, react to it, understand it, and um, take into account of decision making, right? Um, 
uh, which is is really nice. I, I don't know if you've um, just, I can't help but mention some system science perspectives on this. There's a famous story about the lily pads in a pond. Um, and there were a set of, so there's some areas of the world where um, because of over availability of phosphate and, and nitrates runoff from farms and so on. Lakes that were amazing ecosystems got taken over by massive plant infestations, which may sound good, but the problem is the plants die and then they absorb, then they end up uh, uh, rotting and they deplete the oxygen and it kills the, uh, tons of the animals. So you get biological oxygen demand plummeting. One of the lakes that went through this, this eutrophication is, is, um, is in uh, Lake Victoria in Africa. Um, uh, and uh, there's a story of, of the lily pads expanding quickly. And the idea is that the lily pads in the pond double every day. You know, when someone says, well, I'm only gonna take action when the lily pads fill half the pond. How many days do they have left before they take over? One day, right? So when you, things double exponentially, it kind of, you have to intervene early because if you don't, in the next little bit, it'll be having a change or proportional to everything that came before, right? So if you don't react until the hospitals are half full of COVID patients, like it's game over. Like, you, you don't have that luxury with a with an exponential process because by the time you see it in a big way, it's going to overwhelm the entire soon. That's 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 the risk there, right? Um, there's also a classic story I remember hearing when I was first doing system dynamics consulting in around 1993. Um, one of my co co founders of the company we were running. You know, told the story on exponential. Uh, like he said there was a king um, um, who had an advisor who was, I guess, really wanted to reward him. So the king um, uh, offered him, you know, 10,000 pieces of gold or something like that. And the advisor said, actually, king, I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, you know, I, I, won't, I won't take a reward. Um, that reward so big. I'd ask for you for a, a, a much, an, an alternative reward. And the king asked, what would you like? And he said, you know, I'd like you to give me one piece of gold. Um, but every day, um, all you'll do is, is, is double it. Um, and, uh, and just pay me for a month of that. So it'll be, you know, one piece of gold and then two pieces of gold and then four. The king said, yeah, sure. I mean, that's crazy. Of course, I'll do that. Um, two to the 30th is a big number. <laughs> you know, pieces of gold by the end of the, 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 the time, right? Uh, um, and uh, he ended up earning a lot more than 10,000 pieces of gold, right? Um, remember, two to the two to the 16 to 65,536. Um, and that's only halfway through the month, right? Um, anyway, um, okay, so um, metric spaces. What's a metric space? You tell me. What's a metric space? At an at a, at a intuitive level, what's a metric space? A way of measuring distance in different contexts. Good. Good way of measuring distance. That's right. Um, but it's it's not just always Euclidean distance, right? Could it be Euclidean distance? Yeah. Yeah. Well, could you give me another example of a of a metric that's not Euclidean distance? The example from the book would be Manhattan distance yeah. across the Manhattan metric. That's right. Or also called taxicab metric, and so on. Remember that from earlier chapters. There, there was an introduction of that, right? It's kind of kind of a neat metric. Um, taxi, yeah, taxi, uh, taxi metric, and, and actually these come in quite a bit with uh, deep learning, where you have and, and machine learning, where you have L one and L two metrics and, and so on. Um, 
that 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 play a big role in kind of regularization and and and, and this kind of balancing um, overfitting with sort of generality. Um, they, they they end up playing the role now. So there's this notion of a metric which kind of generalizes distance. So it's not just always Euclidean distance. It's not just always distance in two space or three space, like two dimensional space or three dimensional space. It can be these these notions of distance, which take into account, as you said, like um, Manhattan metric, right? You know, where we have endpoint A and point B, and and we can. Um, we measure the distance, uh, you know, in terms of going like this, or we can go like this. And, and as Nona said, you have, you have, uh, you know, you have different ways you can go there. But as long as you don't kind of go away from it, then they're going to be the same, you know, because you got to cross the x and you got to cross y. So as long as you don't go away and I'm waving my hands, you know, you 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 go towards it. It, you you will no matter which way you go it's the same right is that true with with sort of three space then anyway I walk between my home and in here um uh will be kind of a similar distance no right um I could walk a longer way in three space a shorter way but but this 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 the, the metric has that property so she so so this notion of metric can it be any function. She she says we're going to call it d of a comma b, right? So she she has a function distance, right? It's it's a metric. It's describing metric. And in normal fact, we're very used to computer science. She gives it a number d, right? Well, at least what it's right. What it loses in an in intention revealing nature, it makes up for in practice. Right, so what properties does he have to have for it to be a metric? Yeah. Good, not at NSB, not so we'll, we'll put it up here. Mathematicians, it's a yes, exactly, exactly. So so it's it's uh d has these referred to be a metric um uh to qualify right qualify qualify um as a metric then we need what so so the first one was i it's a number, right? It's 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 uh, so it's some uh, number. Is it um, specifically a real number? Well, it could be, but here does it need to be a real number? Here, if 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 our grid is of unit size, right? Units one number. It could actually be an inch, right? And it yeah. can only be an inch, but um, but it would seem like a real number would. It could be a real. But I mean, what I'm saying is that there's some bizarre situation in the high level graph where it could be a complex number. I thought that I was wondering uh, a muffle. Like, okay, great. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, it's a good question. Um, okay, so one thing is that it's a number, and we'll kind of wave her hand about exactly what type it is. She doesn't go into it as much. What else? Is it positive? Always is it positive? Okay. Is it strictly positive or is it non negative? It's non negative, right? Under what condition could the distance be zero between two points? Uh, yes. Good. Good. A and N. That's right. And I think she says. Uh, I, I think she says that um, commonly. Yes. Here, here it is. Criteria three, right? Zero. Can the distance between places ever be zero? Well, well, yes, the distance made A should be zero, right? But is there any other way it can be zero? She says usually not. Um, normally we don't include those in basic no notions of distance. So what we're saying, the distance from A to B can can only be zero if what? 
Distance from A to B can only be zero if what? A equals B. It's only if A equals B. If A equals B, in other words, we're considering distance from A to itself, then it can be zero. But if we're considering a distance between A and B and A is not equal to B, it can't be zero. It has to be not zero. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so non-negative, yeah. Um, and uh, here we'll write um, D of A comma B uh, equals zero, if and only if. A equals, a equals B. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? Symmetry. Symmetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Yeah, uh, a uh, and b. Yeah. Good. Good. D of a comma b equals b and a. B and a. That's right. You got it. You got it. Okay. Um. And and what's the final one? Detours, yeah. right? Um. And what's the notion of the detour? That's right. So adding a stop to your journey cannot do what? Make it shorter. Make it shorter. You know, it could. Uh, it could keep it the same distance, right? Stopping the Davidson on the way from Saskatoon to Regina. I think it's not like it's not a very popular Yeah. <laughs> Crank is in bad too, yeah. right? Uh, Chamberlain. Yeah. Um, uh, so, <laughs> exactly. Um, but it can't make it short, right? And this is interesting because you're saying like there can't be a wormhole that like you could like go over just a little bit and like you're you're, you're suddenly sucked through much quicker than you than you would otherwise, right? And if you think about that, that's that's kind of interesting because like. Here in Saskatoon, the Bridge City, right? Um, like if you add the University Bridge to your agenda, you want to go from your home to the airport. If you add the University Bridge, you could get there quicker than <laughs> than you thought. Like, maybe you could have. Um, but but you know, um, the the distance metric says go. So, so what in what she press, uh, phrases it as? If we have this situation, right? We have we want to go from A to B. Um, but and and if we so if we consider the distance from A to B, right? Um uh and then we consider adding place X to it, right? Um, mm -hmm. um uh, then what do we have? What's the criteria? And D, A, and X, that allows D, A, and X. Yeah, D, A, and X. So that's, we're going from A to X. Plus what? X and B. X and B. That's exactly right. Exactly. Exactly. X and B is what? Bigger than. Bigger than or equal to, right? Yeah. It's the Davidson case where it's equal to, right? Yeah. Um, B of A and B. So we... We can't have going to this extra place X make it any shorter. We can't have it this going to X uh, from A to X and then X to B make it any shorter than this is, right? And that's a criteria for it to be a metric, right? Um, uh, now, you know, she comments on this, and this is, I, I love her sort of narrative. Um, uh, you know, a narrative on these things. Um, uh, and uh, and she says, um, that's the end of the formal criteria for uh, being a type of distance map. It's quite typical. We now give it a formal name, both to emphasize we've made a formal definition to remind ourselves that that some things that aren't, aren't physical distance, Euclidean distance, can count um, as this more abstract type of distance. So we've given it this name, right? We've 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 given that uh, a name, and we 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 call it a metric, right? Um, 
and, and we're not saying that physical distance doesn't exist. We're just saying it's not privilege. It's not the only type of distance that has these properties, right? These properties are shared. These commonsensical properties, these properties that give us this ability to reason about this broad class of things um, are shared by many things beyond physical, you know, um, Euclidean distance, including Manhattan metro. Like you want to go in a city like Manhattan, like an island of Manhattan, you know, between two places, and you have to go, you know, um, in the in the streets and the in the rect rectangular streets. Um, 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 yeah. What happens if we have something like a close uh, space? Yeah. So we can right. be basically on this side. Basically indeed, the indeed, and 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 I think she may comment yeah, on yeah. that here. That um, that she says, and this is um, uh, this is where uh, she's talking about this this generality, right? Um, she says, once we have the definition and set of criteria, aside from working at rigorously finding more examples, we can think about generalizing it by relaxing some criteria, right? And uh, we might think there are some interesting examples that almost satisfy the criteria but not quite, and maybe they deserve to be studied as well. And Tony has mentioned an example like on a sphere, right? Um, it may be that the shortest distance between two places on the sphere is, is, a, is what's called a geodesic. And it's actually not, it doesn't just obey this kind of nice um, Euclidean distance uh, thing. It may be that, it's uh, a type of curve on the sphere. This is, it gets into differential geometry that's different from what your intuition would suggest if it were a flat space, right? Um, uh, and she says, you know, rather than just throw them out or neglect them, mathematicians prefer to make a slightly relaxed notion that will include them and then study that. Um, this makes the theory more difficult because things aren't so rigidly defined because you're relaxing these conditions which are nice in some ways, but it also makes it more interesting um, and it's more inclusive. And there's lots of ones that that are interesting and, and manifestly important, like Tony said, but don't fit neatly all of these criteria, right? And uh, I think, uh, you know, one, one that also comes to mind is like, if, if you want a notion of um, distance that includes how hard it is to get from one place to another, you know, you, you want to consider the hills and so on, right? It may be super easy to get from the top of the hill, top of the ski slope to the bottom, but really hard to get from the bottom of the, the ski slope to the top. So you count it as kind of zero distance going down, but you count it as a uh, heavy distance going up and it violates uh, symmetry. Right. Um, or, or you have a tunnel, right? Um, I was just in Boston, right? Um, for the caregiving trip, and you have this tunnel, and you know, tunnel the airport, and um, or you can go around, you know, uh, through through bridges and and through East Boston and so on, and Chelsea and and Everett and so on, and and you can go further, but adding a place to your itinerary can make it short because you could take the tunnel. You know, you go out of your way to take the tunnel, and then you can get there quicker, right? Um, uh, so uh, here, you know, sometimes I think this rule can be violated uh, in in certain ways. Although, actually, I have to think about it because um, no, I guess because that would be part of the shortest distance from A to B, then, right? Um, so that actually wouldn't be a violation of it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And a what? Grass, grass. Oh, grass. Okay, the donkey and A and grass and B. They want to and A and X to B. Yeah. I always choose to just A to B. <laughs> so, I see. It always wants to go directly to the grass. Yeah. 
I see the straight that's instead of as the crow flies, it wants to go as the donkey trots. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. So so it's always shorter with with the uh, donkey path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think that's right because uh, yeah. Um, there may also be cases where it's um, uh, you you might be able to have I don't know what. I don't know about negative distance, but certainly symmetry could be violated, right? And I'd have to think with, with Tony Case, Case on, a, on a sphere, for example, right? There are these really interesting aspects of geometry that are different there. And where I think this rule would, would have to be uh, revised um, to, to reflect that the, the, the uh, the geometry is such that you're you're doing geometry on this the spherical surface rather than a than a flat surface. Certainly, the classic Euclidean distance doesn't doesn't apply. Certainly, um, but yeah. She, she also mentioned for that specific case that uh, the uh, um, uh, relations become somewhat difficult if we allow right. wrapping around the sphere because then everything is piece of everything. Exactly. Yeah, that's in that in that other chapter or or yeah, he said like um, yeah, that's right. That's actually later in this chapter, right? She talks, um, you know, this wrap wrapping around associated with. Um, is x east of as a east of b or something like that yeah uh that was for chapter six or so oh, I'm, I'm trying to remember okay, yeah. mm -hmm. um then she she talks and we're gonna have to uh what time is it now is it, uh, oh we're already past time oh uh, no no is it oh yeah yeah we are okay so yeah she introduces a uh, basic logic we should be clear about that right um the basics of, of logic here and logical implication. We want everyone to be solid on that. And then modular arithmetic, right? And she illustrates it with this nice, nice uh, um, uh, spiral and everything. And she um, uh, she talks about uh, these lattices of factors. And one thing I just want to highlight: next time we're getting into category theory, and she com she comments that look. Um, Different formal, this is chap, uh, section 6.6. .6. Different formal presentations are possible even when you're using the same type of abstraction. And in the sense, although formality and abstraction are related, they're not quite the same, right? You might have different formal presentations with, with um, the same notion of abstraction. We're going to see that category theory does both of these in a productive way. Um, it comes up with really enlightening forms of abstraction using the notions of abstract relationships. And, it, and so these are these, these arrows, for example, and really enlightening presentations while well, using diagrams of, of, of arrows. Um, so uh, in category theory, it's, it's incredibly cool because you will very commonly like zoom out and zoom in. So you'll have like, a stock flow schema and you'll map it over to set so that that defines the stock and flow diagram. But then you'll zoom out and you'll say, now we consider the category of stock flow diagrams where each stock flow diagram is a point. And we're not gonna go into the details of that point, just like with software engineering, we don't go into the details of what's in every function, but we'll just treat it as a point, just treat it as a function and and it's just a point here. We deal, we reason about the relationships between these stock flow diagrams, so-called homomorphisms between these stock flow diagrams, where one can be collapsed into another. Like one is an approximation to the other by by being, you know, a, a cruder, a sort of coarse grained version of it. So we we take an S uh, model that is susceptible infected and recovered, and susceptible infected. Um, or uh, and uh, and people who are, you know, maybe now, uh, well, yeah. So people who are uh, removed through behavior and removed and and uh, those who are otherwise um, recovered. And in another model, we just map them into susceptible infected, removed, and we don't distinguish recovered people who got infected from 
people who just removed themselves behaviorally. They're they're stepping stepping away and, and staying under lockdown or something. And so there's a homomorphism there. And it's really cool with category theory, you can zoom out and zoom in. So that's what we're gonna be talking about next time. Okay. And Tony, um, you're gonna wanna go through um, it's not incredibly urgent you do it exactly for next time, but you're going to want to go through those chapters one through seven. Okay. Um, uh, so, um, uh, but if we could jump into eight and I think you could start reading that, but maybe read chapters one through seven and the next week. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So it sounds like, can I just have one final poll? Because um, we're trying to make up the missing class. I'm going to stop this uh, recording here. We don't. Um, trying to make up some missing classes because we're kind of in a deficit due to my caregiving trip. Here we go. And so I'm looking for.